Ok, bon courage tout le monde. Merci. Ok, bon courage tout le monde. Oui. Ciao. I admit them. Here it is. Et bienvenue to our continuing Zoom series of lectures about the Grand Chateau of the Loire and Ile de France. My name is Mary Ellen Canellan. I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance Française du Chicago. And it is a pleasure to welcome you today to the Chateau de vaux le vicomte in the company of our special guest, Alexandre de Vaugray, curator of the Chateau, and the series curator, Russell Kelly. But before we get started, a quick reminder, in the event there's anyone unfamiliar with Zoom these days, you've been muted on arrival and will remain muted to avoid sound interference during the talk. But we do encourage you to communicate with us at any time using the chat line. Now that function is at the bottom of your screen. You see a little icon that says chat. Just tap on it and let us know where you're listening from. We also want you to know that you can mute your video at any time uh, during the talk if you would like to. Now, we encourage you to type your questions into this chat function. They will be answered by our guest at the end of his talk. And remember, if you'd like to perfect your French writing skills and speaking, think of the Alliance Francaise. We have many wonderful partners to thank. This series would not have been possible without our lead partner, the Alliance Française de Miami Metro. We would also like to welcome members from our Alliance Network in the US, the French Heritage Society, as well as participants joining us from Weiss in Paris. And finally, a very special welcome to the American friends of the Chateau de Vaux-le-Vicomte. And please, if you will, identify yourselves in the chat line. So now, finally, a few words about Russell, our curator extraordinaire of this series. He is a member of the Alliance Francaise Miami Metro, the curator and moderator of this lecture series on the Grand Chateau of the Loire and Ile de France. And he is the author of The Making of Paris, the story of how Paris evolved from a fishing village into the world's most beautiful city. It is being published this month by Globe Pico Press. He has lived in France for nearly 30 years and has visited every chateau featured in this series many times since his first visit to the Loire Valley 50 years ago. So now, à vous, Russell. Thank you, Mary Ellen. It is my pleasure uh, to introduce today's guest speaker, Alexandre de Beauguet. Alexandre and his two brothers are the fifth generation of his family since 1875 to own the Chateau de vaux le vicomte And Alexandre brings a unique perspective to Vaux since he grew up at the Chateau and knows it intimately. Alexandre and his two brothers are authors of the book, A Day at vaux le vicomte which was published in 2015. And uh, there are both French and English versions of that book. Last week, we visited the Chateau de Chantilly, which was built in the 16th century in the Renaissance style by Anne de Montmorency, the Le Grand Connétable, the great constable who served the last Valois kings. Today, we move ahead 100 years to the reign of the young Louis XIV, the third and greatest king of the Bourbon dynasty, when, as Alexandre uh, will explain, his superintendent of finance, Nicolas Fouquet, builds the magnificent Chateau de vaux le in the French classical style. 
But first, Alexandre invites us to watch a two minute video to introduce the magnificent Chateau de Vaudouis-Comte. À vous, Alexandre. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous tous. Thank you very much for everyone to be here tonight. Uh, well, this is tonight here at Volvicont, and I'm very excited, very thrilled to uh, present the stories, the different stories that um, are surrounding Volvicont since the 17th century. Um, so, thank you very much to the Alliance Francaise. Um, thank you to Russell for this organization, and uh, I hope you'll uh, appreciate those stories. So let me just uh, share my screen here. Um, okay, so now you should have the picture of, uh, except that we are at the very end. Sorry about that. Here we go. Take a tank. Sorry. Uh, do you have my screen? Do you have my screen on the full screen? Yes. Well, now you should have on full screen. Yes. Not quite full screen yet. Uh, it keeps going to the last one, which I don't understand. Uh, what about now? C'est bon. Okay, thank you. Well, Volvicont. So to begin to talk about Volvicont, there is definitely one character that we cannot go away from. This is a witty, charming, ambitious, very ambitious, also a collector of art um, character, very young that is at the very beginning of the story of Volvicont. His name is Nicolas Fouquet. He's the one, of course, on the left of your screen. And uh, the coat of arm of his family on the right, uh, the coat of arm of his family, this is the Fouquet, which is a squirrel in the Anjou dialect where he was born in 1615. Uh, but don't get fooled. This, we are not talking here about the cute little animal who is climbing trees. No, this squirrel is very agile with a massive ambition. His motto tells it all. To what height would he not ascend? But we'll find that his journey will be far from simple. 
Nicolas Fouquet is the son of Marie de Maupou and François Fouquet, a magistrate with links of the powerful Cardinal Richelieu. His career begins in 1636 when his father bought him the office of master of request in the royal household. Imagine, he was okay, barely okay. 21 years old. Okay. In the meantime, Fouquet got married with the young and very wealthy Louise Fauché, who shortly died after giving birth to his first child. His second marriage is as strategic as the first one with Madeleine de Castille, who brings to the couple a very comfortable endowment. Shortly afterward, he purchased the office of Crown Prosecutor at the Parliament in Paris. But then there's the civil war called La Fronde. But Nicolas Fouquet is going to remain very loyal to the royal government. So to Mazarin, the prime minister, and to Anne of Austria, regent and mother of the very young Louis XIV. At the end of the war, and in order to reward him, Mazarin appointed the Fouquet as superintendent of finances. The irresistible rise of Fouquet had begun and he's not even 37 years old. He was a great patron of the arts and a collector, a collection that was displayed at his home of Saint-Mandé. Definitely he changed the taste of the time that he was living in. He was such an influent character and we'll see that just later. So here is the, the, the character. He's got this ambition. He's got also his love of art. He's going to mix both of them. Why and how? We are here in 1639. He is standing in the middle of the fields surrounding by hills, rivers, um, forests. And next to him is standing his great friend, André Le Nôtre, the famous landscape designer. And he wants to fulfill a dream, a fantasy, to have one day the most beautiful house ever. And he's asking his friend André Le Nôtre about this, about this terrain that he's going to inherit from his father. And, um, and how he will be able then to draw the lines of the future, future property. And we can see, um, let me just get this, my mouse. So you can see here uh, the lines of the future chateau. So we've got a first axis that is running east at the top of the picture to west down of the picture. This is a river called Lancueil, and this is going to be the first axis where a future Grand Canal will be built. Then we've got a second axis that has to be perpendicular to the first one, 90 degrees. So this first, this second axis is going to be this one, running north on the left of the screen to right, to uh, sorry, to the south, which is on the right of your screen. Um, except that this, there is this river that is running in the middle of the future garden or the future property. Well, that's not a very big problem in the 17th century. This river will be derivated along into a tunnel that is 600, so almost 4,000 feet long uh, on the east boundary of the estate. And that is going to be the first work that is going to be done from 1641 onwards. Nicolas Fouquet is going to surround him, is going to surround himself with the three best artists of his time. He's got this fantasy of having the most beautiful house and he's also a visionary. He wants not just a house, a garden and a park, he wants a masterpiece. He wants something that would break with the canons and habits of Louis XIII that he consider already as old fashioned. So he's going to surround himself with those three artists, Louis Levo as the architect, and there is no known um, portrait of Louis Levo, André Le Nôtre in the middle that we just talked about, and Lebrun, the painter decorator. The, what he's going to offer to those three artists is what would any artist would dream of. A blank canvas 
of 1,200 acres, a lot of money. He married intelligently or strategically, as we say at the time. Um, he also inherited from a very successful um, business that his father, Francois Fouquet, had put on of um, commerce between France, Brittany, and the island of Antilles. Um, and he's going to make this business even more successful. So don't get fooled, don't get misunderstood. There is a man who is already very successful at barely 35 years old and very rich. He's going to hire those three artists, give them again what any artist would dream of, the blank canvas, a lot of money and freedom. Freedom to do whatever they want at one condition, two conditions actually. One that they had to work together, hands in hands, to the point where today it's difficult to know exactly who have done what. And second, to work, to be as bold as and innovative as possible. Again, Fouquet wants to blow the mind of everyone, especially the court, especially the king. Why? Because that's his way of showing his influence, his intelligence, his taste, his power, his wealth. 20 years later, rise Volvicont, the estate that is of 1200 acres. He has been uh, buying a lot of terrain on the south of the chateau in order to get the water, in order to get enough water to make his fountains running. That's a little detail, but at the time it was not a detail. It was the best way to show how wealthy you were by throwing for free water out of a fountain just for the beauty of it. How charming is that, no? Um, so let's go a little bit more um, precisely into the mise en scène of the estate. You, as you saw with the drone footage, we go, we enter the estate from the great um, gate that I'm pointing out with my mouth here on the bottom center of the screen. And right from the beginning, you're not, you're not even inside the estate, but you can see the chateau on his hall. And you can see also on both sides of the chateau, the beginning of a garden. So you have to remember that just a, a few years ago, before we were in the medieval era, we were in war. Just the war with Spain just finished. The Treaty of the Pyrenees has been signed in 1659. And thanks God, France is at peace. So Fouquet, wants to put the enjoyment of life as a number one priority. He wants to show everything right at the beginning. So right at this gate, you can see almost everything. That's what you think, actually. Then you go on this first courtyard and you can see the outbuildings on the side. And you can see that they are built with bricks. And the chateau is not built with, with bricks, which was the tradition at the time, but with uh, sandstone until the ground floor and then limestone. And actually, um, Louis Leveau had offered, had a, a first proposal to uh, Fouquet by um, drawing a map, a very precise drawing of the chateau with bricks. That first Fouquet had accepted, but then he came back on his decision and said, no, I want for the chateau some noble, noble materials and only noble materials. And I want brick for the outbuilding. So then it shows this, it is a word that I cannot pronounce correctly, hierarchy in French. So hierarchy, I, I don't know, I'm sorry about that, but I'm sure you, you got it all. So it shows the order, the first row of the theater is brick, is just a secondary row before going to the main level, which is the one of the chateau with noble materials. Um, then you're going to cross the second gate here in order to enter into the honor courtyard with the remain of what could have been the L of the chateau, the L buildings of the chateau. But no, 
Levaux, the architect, and Fouquet decided to have them on a first row to have them completely detached from the main house. But what is interesting with this picture of Vauvicon is that there is some reminiscence of the medieval era with the moat. What is the moat about in a chateau of enjoyment? Well, it is, I guess, a way to uh, remember one's ancestor. It's also a way to put the chateau floating as an island on water. Um, and you've got this, uh, well, we can't see it here, but we, we, we have on the other side a drawbridge. So um, there is at Volvicont the, some reminiscence of the past. There is definitely the present because we're right in front of a masterpiece. And there is the future with a lot of innovations. Um, some innovations are this width of the chateau. The chateau has a, a width that is doubled from the one that has been known under Louis XIII. And this is a, a decision of Levaux that Fouquet was very excited about because thanks to this double width, he then can imagine um, an organization of rooms between the north and the south where you don't have to cross all the room to go from one side of the chateau to the other, but you can go and work in a quinconce. So you can go from one room on the north to the room on the south, and then going back on the, on the north. So it is a more comfortable way to live in a chateau. And don't forget that Nicolas Fouquet wanted the chateau to be his main residency. And that's very important. It's not just to show off, it's to make this house a family home. This is why I always remember my father talking about this place, never as the chateau, always as home or the house, which can be, which can sound a little bit snobbish, um, uh, you know, to, to talk about the house when we're talking about a chateau with 100 rooms or more. Um, but it's also a way to say, well, you know, this is our home and it has been our home, but that's another story. Um, the garden is something that I won't be able to tell you much about because I think it would be an, in an insult to talk through a screen about such a garden. A garden, remember that Le Nôtre says this wonderful phrase. He say, the eyes creates the perspective walking makes it alive. And it's definitely an invitation for people, the guest of Nicolas Fouquet, for the guest of today, not to stand on the south facade or terrace of the chateau and take a picture of the soi-disant symmetrical garden and then have an ice cream at the cafeteria, um, even though it's good for a cafeteria. I will always encourage people to walk at least to the first uh, pool, which is right behind the chateau here. The, we call it the rondo, the round uh, pool. In order to go there, to turn around and to have a look at that view that is similar to this one, but this one is the best view. You can see the chateau dominating the scene wherever you are standing on the garden, you are dominating, he's dominating the scene. He is built on a central south to north axis along which everything is getting organized. It is a very simple architecture. It is very simple, but all the work to make that architecture simple is just unbelievable. And it brings the genius of Le Nôtre to do and to bring this masterpiece to life. This is a picture that I like very much, first, because it's one, during one of our candlelit evenings, but second, above all, it really illustrates what I just said. The chateau is dominating the scene. The L, the wings, as we say in French, les ailes des communs, the wings of the outbuildings are giving a balance to the whole 
you know, to the whole property, to the whole line. You've got the chateau in the middle, very powerful with this dome. This dome being such a great characteristic of Louis Levaux that is very inspired by the Italian um, Renaissance architecture. Um, so again, the garden is a fantastic place. Le Nôtre has been um, very intelligent. It, is, it was the first work that Le Nôtre had from scratch. He has been working all his career in existing garden. For the first time in his life, he was waiting for this um, order from, for, and, and it's coming from Fouquet. And Fouquet is giving him this blank canvas saying, you know, Le Nôtre, do whatever you want, but be innovative. And he's going to create the pioneering, the pioneering work of the French formal garden. The grammar of the French formal garden has been written at Volvicomte and everything else has been declination of this garden of Volvicomte. Let's go back to our story. Nicolas Fouquet has been just appointed as superintendent of finance because he was so loyal to the king. He was a great friend of the king. Um, but there is this man on the left corner of, the of your screen called Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Jean-Baptiste Colbert is the, we would say today, the personal assistant of Mazarin, the prime minister at the time, except that Mazarin is very ill and Mazarin is going to die on the 9th of March, 1661. The 10th of March, the next day, the young Louis XIV gather his main minister around him and tells them, until now, Feu de Cardinal Mazarin has governed my affairs. From now on, you will not sign a single passport without my authorization. So basically, Le, uh, 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 Louis XIV is putting his fist on the table and saying, from now on, I am the only one who is going to govern this country. And I won't need any prime minister. And this is something that Fouquet cannot believe. Fouquet's ambition wants to become the next prime minister. Jean-Baptiste Colbert has exactly the same ambition, except that Jean-Baptiste Colbert is not as successful and charming and loved as Fouquet. Madame de Sévigné has this nickname for Colbert, the North. He was such a calculating kind of person. He was cold and, um, and he suffered from that. And he wanted Fouquet out of his way. So he's going to convince the king that Fouquet is the bad guy, that Fouquet is convincing, that Fouquet is trying to overthrow the king by putting up an army in Brittany that Fouquet is stealing some money in the treasurer of the state. He's going to destroy some evidence, to invent some other evidence. And there is a little incident that you have to realize, to know, to understand the Machiavellic character of, um, of Colbert and how he succeeded to convince the king that Fouquet was the bad guy, is that during the civil war, the, um, uh, Louis XIV was 13 years old. He was in the Louvre, he was living in the Louvre and the powerful people, uh, seigneur of the country, wanting him, uh, overthrown him. So they were banging at the door of the Louvre and uh, the young, very little kid had to flee. And he flee with his mother to Saint-Germain-en-Laye, to a chateau in the outskirts of Paris that, was, that had no furniture, no fireplace, uh, no bed. And he got traumatized by this experience. And when Colbert tells him, be careful with your friend Fouquet, he really might be your number one enemy. He's remembering that nightmare of his childhood and decide to give credit to what Colbert is telling him. 
three months before the famous party, the inaugurational party of Volvicon, three months before, in May 1661, Colbert and the king are going to put up a plot in order to arrest Nicolas Fouquet, to decide for the date of the arrest, decide the judges that will be the judge of his trial, um, and will get rid of Fouquet. For the moment, in the meantime, the last preparation of this lavish party are on the way. Uh, Vatel, the famous um, intendant, a maître d'hôtel, is organizing the whole party. Lully is writing uh, the music. Torelli uh, is organizing the, fire, the firework. Uh, Molière has just written a play in three weeks called Les Fâcheux, who very soon uh, is going to be uh, on stage in the garden of Volvicon. So there is, all the court is there. The king is coming from Fontainebleau with the court and with his mother. Um, and they're going to be blown away. They're going to be absolutely blown away by something that they had never seen in their whole life. They never seen a chateau like Volvicot. They never seen such a grand garden with all those optical illusions that Le Nôtre uh, had set on the garden, with all those flat, those fountains gushing, those cascades, the water uh, that are reflecting the sky. Um, I mean, there is definitely something that is absolutely new about this garden. And there is a new art of the garden that, that were just born at this very same time, that this very same place, even though we are talking here about, you know, an evolution of the garden since the last 50 years uh, that are arriving at a sort of pinnacle at Volvicont. Nicolas Fouquet is drowned on his own ambition. He doesn't see anything. He doesn't see the danger, despite the fact that his friends and Madame de Sévigné is uh, uh, first of them uh, are putting a note in one of his pockets during the party saying, be careful. There is a man who wants you dead, Colbert. I'm not sure the king is uh, 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 showing his greatest you know, face because he looks quite annoyed by all this, um, all this party, all what Fouquet is showing. And Fouquet, at the time of the party, is telling the king, sire, this is for you. Volvicomte is for you. He's, he's offering Volvicomte to the king. And you have to know that this is very genuine from Fouquet. Again, he doesn't know anything, which is weird, which is, one can ask uh, oneself how such an intelligent character was so naive. Um, again, I think he was just convinced about his success. Three weeks later, as decided by Colbert and the king, three weeks later, three weeks after the party, um, Fouquet is in Nantes and got arrested by D'Artagnan, one of his best friends, the captain of the Musketeers. The trial is going to last not three weeks as uh, Colbert and the king thought, but three years because he, Fouquet is so brilliant in his defense that he's going to convince more than half of the judges that he's not guilty, as guilty as Colbert and the king wanted to prove. And more than half of the judges are going to decide to send Nicolas Fouquet in exile, outside the kingdom for life, but alive. And for the first and unique time of French history, the king, considering Fouquet too much of a dangerous character, even outside the kingdom, is going to go against the sentence of the judges, use his right of grace, if I may say, and decide for prison for life for his superintendent of finance. This is the second time that Louis XIV is putting a fist on the table, saying, first, 
I'm decided to govern by myself. And second, I'm powerful enough to put my own minister of finance in prison for life. And he's telling that to all of Europe, you know, showing the absolutism of Louis XIV. This is really the two first signs of the absolutism of Louis XIV. Louis XIV is going to take the same three artists and is going to build Versailles four years later. The first works are beginning at Versailles. Louis XIV understood perfectly the strategy of Fouquet. Nicolas Fouquet wanted to show his wealth, influence, taste, and power by and through the arts because he was a true lover of the art. Louis XIV is going to do exactly the same thing at Versailles. He's going to show not just France, not just Europe, but the whole world, who is the boss, basically, if I may say, by building Versailles with Le Vaux, the architect, Le Brun, painter, decorator, and Le Nôtre, the landscape designer, the dream team, as a lot of people um, um, uh, put it. Um, even today, this is a chateau that has been built in the outskirts of Paris um, 10 years ago. It has been sold for a huge fortune. It is a pale copy of Volvicomte. What I wanted to tell you also with those two Chinese Volvicont, that Volvicont today is still of some inspiration. And that is something that I like to remember. Let me just skip here 200 years. Sorry about that, but you know, in 45 minutes, I would like to concentrate on the main topics of Volvicont. And for me, the one of the Saumier family is definitely something quite incredible. We have this man, is a wealthy industrialist from, um, that made his fortune through the sugar industry um, that is going to visit Volvicon because one of his friends is telling him, you know, you're a lover of the art. You love what we call the vieilles pierres in French. Um, and there is this chateau that is beautiful that is going to be sold at an auction. Alfred Saumier, his name, is going to visit the chateau. He's going to be in awe of such a place of the beautiful paintings that are still in impe impeccable place, state, uh, the, the paintings on the ceiling, the 17 paintings from Le Brun, and consider that Volvicon is a national treasure. He's going to be the only one at the auction. He's going to buy Volvicon and dedicate the rest of his life and part of his fortune to resuscitate this place. Uh, Alfred Sommier was my great, great grandfather. He was coming from a very modest family. And um, I always heard my father and now my two brothers and I being very respectful and very admirative of such a character that uh, built his fortune with the sweat of his forehead and dedicate his second part of his life to uh, Volvicon. Definitely he saved Volvicon. He's going to um, uh, put some huge work of restoration as the last family abandoned the place for 20 years. Uh, he's going to begin with the chateau because he's going to live there with his family for six to seven months a year. He's going to acquire some exquisite piece of art, uh, such as those commode Mazarine by Charles-André Boulle, um, some tapestries of the 17th century. And he's going to make all this for himself and for his family. Um, there is also a little, a little collection of cabinets of 17th century, such as the one on the left of uh, Pietra Dura, um, which are part of the collection of Volvicont and the collection also of Les Amis de Volvicont. This is the state of the garden when he acquired the place in 1875. Sorry, I, I didn't tell you the date, but we are here in 1875. And after 20 years of abandon, you can imagine that the nature came back into the garden and the garden of Lenaud had for long disappeared. But what um, um, 
Alfred Sommier wants is to find out about at least the spirit of uh, André Le Nôtre's garden. And he's asking his um, uh, architect, uh, Achille, uh, sorry, uh, Hippolyte Detailleur, um, to try to find, to do something, to find something about Le Nôtre. And this Hippolyte Detailleur is going to ask one of his collaborators in his agency uh, called Elie Lenné, a completely unknown landscape designer. But this landscape designer knows that the, during the 18th century, uh, beginning of the 18th century, when the fashion of French formal garden be, uh, changed into the pittoresque and romantic garden, it was easier for the owners to cover the former garden with a few inches of soil on top of which the new garden would be planted instead of removing the plant of the former garden and plant again. So what he's going to do is, he's going to, uh, here we go. He's going to uh, study carefully the engraving of the 17th century from Israel Silvestre and look where some masonry work, stairs, terrace, degrees has been built. And he's going to then locate those specific work that he would ima that he imagine can be exactly at those specific places on the garden that he has in front of him. And he's going to dig and he's going to find the skeleton, the blueprint of the Le Nôtre garden. So we have someone there that was that had this wonderful idea to dig at the right place and to find the skeleton. So what we have, if we, we, you know, I'm sure you've played when you were a kid at this game of the seven differences. Well, we can play at the same game, you know, and there's 350 years of difference between the engraving at the top of your screen and the picture uh, at the bottom of your screen. What definitely changed is the surface of the garden, the skin of the garden. Definitely, uh, Edme Sommier, the son of Alfred Sommier, decided to restore the garden by uh, uh, asking one of the great landscape designers of the time, Achille Duchesne, to reinterpret the garden of Renaud. And the embroidery box that you can see on the main parterre are from a design of Achille Duchesne. Volvicon is a home again. This is some pictures, black and white pictures from the era of the Sommier family. That was, you know, the Grand Salon that is empty today, but that was their living room. And, um, and here is the way how from the Sommier family, it went to the Vaugué family. The daughter of Edme, the, sorry, the sister of Edme Sommier is the only child of the family who is going to have some children. Uh, she's going to marry my great grandfather, Robert de Vaugué, who is standing here on the Place de la Concorde because he was one of the founder of the Automobile Club de France. My father, Patrice de Vaugué, received the chateau as a wedding gift in 1967 when he got married with my mother. Well, you can tell me if it's a gift or not. Well, it's a, it's a pretty heavy one, uh, we, we might say. Um, and he, the fortune of the family is not the one at the, uh, uh, that was known at the on, in the 19th century. Uh, there've been some wars, there've been some succession. And my father decided to open the family home to the public. This is going to be the beginning of this last era, some 53 years ago, 1968, Patrice de Vaugué opens the family home to the public. That was the first scandal in the family. I mean, imagine that uh, I would, I mean, that you can say to suddenly your parent, I'm going to open this house to the public and anyone can enter uh, by uh, buying a ticket. It was not the last scandal. There were a few other scandals in the family. Don't worry, that's part of the family dynamics, I would say. Um, he restored the first floor of the chateau, which are the private apartments of Nicolas Fouquet. Here is the room of Nicolas Fouquet, until his three sons decide at three different times of their respective life to come back to the family estate and to help one's father 
to uh, fulfill and to, to, to continue the mission of sharing this masterpiece with the public. Um, we are today, the three brothers, in charge of this largest estate classified as a historical monument in France. Um, it's definitely not something that we are proud of as being the largest one in France. It just makes it the most costly to, to maintain. Um, I'll just give you a few figures in order for you to realize uh, uh, what is Volticont about. It is, so we talked about the, the surface, 1200 acres. It's surrounded by, the, by an eight miles wall. Um, there is a canal of uh, one kilometer long. There are um, 12 hectares of lawn, uh, two hectares of roof, and 225, so that's going to be something like 18, 17 miles of pipes, water pipes uh, for the hydraulic system. For that, there is, we have today 75 people working. Uh, it is a company that is managed as a non for profit, um, as we put absolutely every single penny back into the economy of the estate in order to restore um, what we have to restore. So we have historical monument restoration on one side, and we have maintenance on the other side. That, as you can imagine, takes a very great part of the budget. To, in order to um, get the revenues, of course, we have the visit, we have the candidate evening that I was telling you about uh, with uh, fireworks, and that is every Saturday. Uh, we have the Grand Siècle, the Journée Grand Siècle, where people come dressed and they are fanatic people with rec historical reconstitution that are dressed and that, that make this fantastic uh, 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 show, actually. They make the show in the garden and Christmas uh, decoration at Christmas time. And what uh, interests me even more is the restoration work. And I'm just going go to go through a few projects. That was uh, the restoration of the ceiling of Le Brun uh, in the Salon des Muses that was completely restored thanks to uh, a very generous friend and donor, American donor, Alexis Grégory, um, in 2015. We are today uh, restoring the Grand Salon. Today, the Grand Salon is filled with 60 tons of scaffolding and we're going to restore the cupola, 400 square meter of a cupola where you can see um, um, uh, uh, a 19th century painting onto which we're going to project the fresco that Le Brun wanted to paint onto this cupola 350 years ago. Because of the arrest of Nicolas Fouquet, he didn't have time to do this fresco, but he did some preparatory drawings that are in Le Louvre. We're going to use those preparatory drawings in order to project them on a monumental projection onto this cupola in order to show the visitors how was this cupola, uh, how was supposed to be this cupola uh, three centuries and a half ago. So we're very excited about this project. Um, we're going to restore also all the statues, the terms, that are around uh, the, 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 the cupola. And I had the privilege just three days ago to uh, climb on the scaffolding and to have a look. I could touch those cupola that are standing at uh, 15 meters uh, above the ground. So it was really fantastic to be as close as possible to those um, beautiful elements that has been drawn, every single of them by Lebrun himself and sculpted by Jacques Ouzo, and one term, the one of the uh, winter, is sculpted by François Girardon, famous sculptor that uh, worked a lot at Versailles. This is a montage of the fresco that will be projected in 2022 onto the cupola. In 2021, we will show the friendship onto the same cupola. We're going to show the friendship, the story of the friendship between Fouquet and Jean de La Fontaine, his great friend, Jean de La Fontaine, 40th 
uh, birthday celebration in 2021. Let's go back to the reality, even though it was reality before, uh, uh, very soon. Um, uh, but that's more of a sad reality if the boxwood. The boxwood has been attacked by the box blight and by the moth. Um, and uh, that was, uh, that began in 2014, all the way to 2018. 2018, we had some fierce, fierce attack of the moth that defoliate the 70 to 80% of our boxwood. It was not possible anymore to show such a disaster to our guests, to our visitors. So a scientific committee got gathered and confirmed the fact that it was not possible anymore to maintain those embroidery boxwood that were designed by Le Nôtre first and then by Achille Duchesne, as I was telling you. We decided very sadly to remove all those boxwood. And we decided also in the same time to put up a call for proposal among artists and designers um, to think about a project for 2019. Here is the project, uh, the ephemeral ribbons um, by French artist Patrick Urcade. We are very proud and very happy with this project because the compliment that we've been hearing, I'm sure not everyone are, is happy with that. I mean, you, 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 know, you do something and you always have some criticism, then that, that's fair enough. But what we've been hearing a lot is they, they seem to have been there forever. And this is exactly what we wanted. Um, just one minute, Russell, can you hear me? What, how, how long is my speech? I'm, I'm, I, I forgot to put my watch on. Oh, you're doing very well. Uh, you're doing well. Okay. Okay. Five, um, more. five more minutes, you said? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So this is the French formal uh, garden that has been transformed on that very specific area by this artist, um, putting, taking the main embroidery on the left side of your screen, he took the main green and black embroidery and put it into aluminum in order to reflect the sky. And from a certain angle, it can even um, uh, look like a river, like water. So it's, it's, we, 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 it was our first step into contemporary art that was quite taboo for many, 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 many years at Volvicon and within the family. But uh, I think this first step is a success. Um, I've been talking about a few projects that has been made uh, in terms of architecture, in terms of painting. Um, the garden needs a lot of restoration. And what we wanted to do, we just finished a three years program of restoration, uh, a progr a restoration program this year. We are beginning another three years program and we have a main project that has been decided among my brother, a scientific committee, and the architect en chef des monuments historiques. It's to put the water system in function every day and every night during which the estate is open. For the moment, the hydraulic system works as it was working in the 17th century. It's a gravitary system. Basically, you have two high water reservoir on the two high points of the estates, one on the north, one on the south. When we open the circuit, the water drop in a very light slope, but enough in order to feed those fountains with jets of water. Except that when we open those reservoir, we have six to seven hours of fountains working. What we want, and then it's empty. So then we have to wait between five and 10 days in order for the rain and for the spring, the water spring, to fill up those reservoir again. That's why until now we've been programming the fountains only twice a month. What we want to do is to program them every day and every evening. You just don't know how much water makes this garden alive. It would be, there would be a before and an after. It will change the life of this estate. 
We are very excited about this project. Um, it's going to take from two to three years to bring electricity all the way to the canal, to put a pump into the canal and to pump some water up to the reservoirs. So we'll get water all the time. Um, this is exciting and this is the kind of decision that my brothers and I have the privilege to take, to maintain, to restore and to share this masterpiece of the 17th century to the broader number of people. And we always try to think about Nicolas Fouquet, to think about this man who designed, who imagined this place for the love of the arts. That's why we try at our very humble scale to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexandre. Uh, what a great story uh, uh, and what a magnificent chateau and a, a, a brilliant photo to end your lecture on, which shows uh, you refer to it as an imperfect symmetry. So uh, it looks pretty perfect from here. In what way is it imperfect? Well, um, this is exactly what would Le Nord would be happy to hear because that's what he wanted to show but he also, by a work of terrace, of level, we can see it's symmetrical on the main axis. But if you go a little bit on the side, you can see on the right here, the flower bed of Nicolas Fouquet that my father restored in 2000. And on the left, you've got the crown parterre. Why a crown parterre? Because we are on the side of the apartment of the king. And as a friend of the king, Nicolas Fouquet wanted to show his friendship by putting the royal crown here on the, in the center of the basin. So basically we have, yes, a central axis that is dividing uh, the estate in two very symmetrical parts, but then we've got transversal axis. And this is the first transversal axis at the end of which, things are changing. There is a flower bed on the right because Fouquet wanted some flower, despite the fact that it was definitely not part of the fashion of a French formal garden, and a, a parterre with three pools of water on the east side. Then we've got a second axis, which is this one with the little canoe and some fountains here that we can see and the potager on the right that we cannot see. But basically you're very right. It is symmetrical, but it's not symmetrical. Where is the Grand Canal? The Grand Canal is here. So this is a picture that is, of course, taken from a drone or from a, actually a paraglide, from a paraglide. And we can see almost everything. But if you are at the level of the ground, you don't see the canals, the, those canals here, and you don't see the Grand Canal. And actually what you see is this last pool of water, the square one, with the grotto that are almost like at the same level of, the se of this, of this, uh, of this uh, last pool. So there is a lot of optical illusion that are quite difficult to explain on a screen. Again, I would be delighted to welcome you here at Volvicon and to tell you that during a nice stroll in the garden. Would you tell us where the name comes from, please? Absolutely. Vaux is the plural of, of Val. Un Val, which is a valley, um, it, and two Vaux. So we are, as I explained earlier uh, in my presentation, at the cross of two valleys, two rivers. That is for Vaux. And Vicomte, it's a Vicomté, and a Vicomté is an, uh, 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 um, how do you say, uh, space, a land that has been won by the seigneur of the area thanks to a battle that he won of his neighbor. So we're talking here about the medieval era and about the very beginning of the aristocracy and the title of an aristocrat. If you were a vicomte, that means that you were won a battle of your neighbor that was 
relatively small. If you were winning a battle with a larger scale of land, then you were winning a duché and you were the duke, and then a marquisat, and then you were a marquis. So you have all those scales. And Vicomte, that was part of the Vicomté de Melun, of the next town, and that's how it's called Vaux le Vicomte. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier that the, uh, when Fouquet was selecting the noble materials for the chateau, he decided to put in sandstone on the ground floor and limestone above. Is that usual to, comp to change stones? Why did he switch stones? Well, he doesn't, he didn't switch stones. The, thi the thing is that uh, Volvicont is built on a natural um, uh, uh, hill made of sandstone. Remember, Fontainebleau is not very far away. And in Fontainebleau, you've got a lot of sand and a lot of sandstone, the, those famous boulders where you climb on it. And uh, at Volvicont, we have some boulders in the, far, in the park. And there is this um, surface, this higher sur little hill of sandstone that Volvicon has been built on. And it's a much tougher uh, solid rock than the limestone. So it makes sense to build the base of the chateau with sandstone and then the rest of the chateau with uh, uh, less solid, but above all, uh, lighter uh, rock than sandstone. Okay. What happened to uh, Monsieur Fouquet? Um, how did he spend the rest of his life? In prison. In prison. One prison or did he move around? Oh, he moved around. He, he was arrested in Nantes. Then he moved to Angers. Then he moved to La Bastille where he had his trial. Uh, after his trial, he was sent to Pignerol uh, where I show the, the, the engraving. And uh, Pignerol was at the time in the, uh, was still in the Piedmont Alps, uh, which are in Italy today, but were part of France at the time. He spent 19 years in prison and died in 1680 in prison. Wow. Um, you showed a great photo that uh, showed how the outbuildings, the wings of the outbuildings balance the chateau uh, when seen from a distance, uh, which is a very interesting. What uh, were the outbuildings built to house originally and what are in the outbuildings today? Um, so the outbuildings on the west, so the one on the right of the picture um, were designed for mainly the carriages and the horses, so stables. Um, the one on the left, there was a farm. There was a chambre de justice, which is basically a place where you, you do trials because Fouquet, as the vicomte of the place, had the right to do, give justice or to do justice. There was also a lot of craftsmen um, that were, uh, had their workshop in the outbuildings and also all the animals of the farm, etc. Today, we have the same division. On the right, we have all the outbuildings that are dedicated to the visitor center, to the carriage museum, to our office. I am today, uh, this evening, on this West outbuilding. Um, and then on the East outbuilding, that's where my father decided to put his home and to have his family, uh, because when we were, when we were um, uh, living in the chateau, on the first floor of the chateau, we had to move, you know, we were using some rooms, some stately rooms as our own living room and dining room. So we had to hide the TV and uh, hide the toys of the kids, uh, my brothers and I, so the visitors could visit a proper, you know, 17th century chateau. So then we moved to the outbuildings, to the east outbuildings where I still live today. Can you can visitors go up to the roof of the chateau? Yeah, absolutely. There is a, there is a way to go to the roof uh, through a corridor, and that's one aspect that I didn't talk because I cannot talk about everything. But the corridor were invented by Levaux at Volvicont. 
And it is a way of distributing through a uh, ax some rooms on both sides. So next time you will get out of your um, of your elevator in the next hotel you'll go and facing this long corridor, you can say uh, that that was invented at Volvicon. So you, we, we use this long uh, second floor corridor going to above the cupola and below the beam structure of the dome, which are which is absolutely amazing to see. And then we go out on the little, uh, the top of the dome, which is just there. Um, and we can enjoy the view, a 360 degrees view uh, of the estate. Is that a, a special trip? Is not, not do anybody from the public cannot do that. Do you have to be specially accompanied to go up there? Well, that's, um, you put the finger, as we say in French, on a little, very little, but little um, uh, uh, issue between my brothers and I. My brother Jean Charles is uh, is the sales director. I'm in charge of the uh, development, and I would love to have this dome for my most generous donors, for example, or for journalists who always want to see something special that the visitors don't see. But then my brother said, "Well, actually, we make." We ask for a three euros uh, supplement to go on the dome, and it's something like eighty or ninety thousand euros every year. So my brother says, "Do you want to get rid of those name ninety thousand uh, euros?" So it's an endless conversation, and we haven't uh, found. Um, well, I, he's he's still winning, actually. <laughs> uh -huh. I think he might even be able to up the price uh, because he, the the view must be amazing from it up there. It is. If you don't have access to a paraglider. So after uh, Vo, uh, after Fouquet was arrested, what happened to Vo? Uh, Vo um, was empty. Um, the king took absolutely everything. Well, almost everything, because the son of uh, Fouquet uh, sold some of the furniture. But Colbert and the king took the best of the collection of Fouquet. There was 150 tapestries. There were 200 statues in the garden. Everything was taken to go to the Louvre and then to Versailles and then now today to other places. Um, um, the family of Fouquet got sent to exile. So Marie-Madeleine de Castille, his wife. And after 10 years, she could recuperate the estate because the king accepted her to be back except that Fouquet haven't had the time to pay all of his, uh, all of those people who work on the construction and the last details of the uh, chateau and the garden. And all those workers were back to the estate and asked for their money to, uh, the, the, to the, the wife of Nicolas Fouquet. Um, she stayed 30 years there. And mm -hmm. then when her son died, she decided to sell the estate to the Maréchal de Villars, very important soldier of the army of the king, who stayed at Volvicomte until uh, 1764. And then the um, Duc de Choiseul Pralin, Duc et Duchesse de Choiseul Pralin, were the last owners before my family. They, were, they are the ones who saved the chateau during the revolution. They convinced the commission of the art that First, it was not a royal chateau. And second, it was such a masterpiece that it would be used as a model for the students of architecture that were studying architecture and garden design. And that's how she saved the chateau. Spectacular. Well, there are so many questions that we could ask, but I'm afraid we have come to the end of our, 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 our allotted time. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Alexandre, for your brilliant presentation. We can't wait to visit uh, the Chateau and I'm particularly looking forward to uh, 2022. I don't wanna wait till then to visit it, but I wanna see that projection on the cupola, which sounds like an amazing new idea. The, the idea of restoring or converting the uh, hydraulic system from the old gravity system to a uh, electricity dr uh, driven pump system where you can see the gardens, uh, the fountains every day is, is brilliant. So we don't have to wait for those two times a month. 
to visit the Chateau. So thank you so much for that. And, and for people in the audience, uh, you will be receiving a recording of today's lecture uh, in the next day or two. Um, by the way, I should mention that Alexandre is not only the author of uh, co-author of a day uh, a visit at Vaudevicomte, but also of the Guide de Haute Montagne. You maybe don't have that handy. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but there are people in the audience who have read it and like it. So oh. you you're, uh, you have many arrows in your quiver, <laughs> as we say. Uh, so thank you also to our co-host, the Alliance Française de Chicago and Miami Metro, our partners of Federation of Alliance Française USA, French Heritage Society, and Weiss. Thanks to all of you attending the lecture today and especially to the American friends of the Chateau de Vaux-le-Vicomte. And we encourage you to please tune in next Thursday for a tour of Chateau, the Chateau sometimes known as the Palais de Versailles, where we will meet once again, the uh, dream team that was uh, referred to uh, by Alexandre of Le Vaux, Le Brun and Le Nôtre in the company of the chief heritage curator, Bertrand Rondeau. And he will be giving his lecture in English uh, as well. And now I would please ask everyone to unmute themselves and to join me in giving Alexandre de Vaugouet a big round of applause. I think this is very well done. No, I think so too.